Welcome to episode 23. Today we've got how to mic a guitar cab, uh, how to mix strings and orchestral stuff with uh, heavy rock and metal tracks, and vocal compression and limiting. Three, two, one. This is the Axe JV Show. Our first question comes from Josh. What mic or mics do you use on the guitar cabinet? Love your videos and all the helpful content you make. Yeah, and that video and really um, pretty much all of the re guitar recordings I've done on so many albums, um, it's just an SM57 on the cab. Um, I like to place it right kind of where the uh, the middle, like the dust cap, I believe it's called, and the, the cone. So right where those two meet is where I usually start with the mic placement, right up on the grill. Uh, and then I listen to it. If uh, if it's too bright and harsh, I move it more towards uh, the outside of the speaker. And if it needs to be brighter, I move it more towards the center. Um, if there's too much low end, I move it back. If there's not enough, I move it closer to the cab. Um, so that's it. Um, like this question is, again, specifically talking about uh, a certain YouTube video I've done about mixing heavy guitars. Um, but I'm answering it here because uh, it really applies to uh, guitar recording as a whole. Um, it's always been, I've tried so many things like multiple mics, different mics on the cab, and I just always would go back to um, just a single SM57 in the right spot on the cab. Daniel asks, how do you go about handling the panning for these modern day metal hardcore mixes that have upwards of 10 to 20 orchestral and synth tracks? Do you still keep a fairly LCR panning approach and let them overlap and rely on EQ to carve the space? Or do you do an orchestral type panning where you spread each of the elements all across the stereo spectrum to allow space for each? Yeah, in those cases, I'd say it's mostly uh, going to be just all left center, right, um, with overlapping, you know, with the guitars also being panned out hard and the orchestral stuff panned out hard. Um, but I don't know there's kind of some exceptions because usually when I get that stuff, it's fairly uh, submix already. So if there's like violins, cellos, and different strings and or whatever, um, usually I'm getting those as just stereo stems with it's already kind of pre-mixed. And so maybe within that stereo track stuff might be panned out um, uh, in varying degrees. Um, I think a common thing for orchestral stuff, at least for string sections and whatnot, um, there are uh, kind of set guidelines of where, um, you know, the physical players are supposed to sit in a room. Um, you know, in terms of from the audience of where certain instruments are placed. And usually when people um, produce that kind of stuff, they're following that in the panning. So, uh, but again, usually if I'm mixing it, it's already put down to a stereo track um, with that. And I just kind of leave it how it is. Um, if I'm getting everything broken out into separate tracks, um, I might pan some stuff a little differently, you know, and again, I'll just uh, look up, you know, what are the common placements for these certain elements? Uh, and I'll kind of roughly follow that. But in general, I try to keep it out wide as much as I can. And then, uh, like you said, just use e EQ to um, work on the separation between those. I have a string section in several songs that I'm mixing. They were recorded very well and sound amazing on their own, but I'm having trouble getting them to sit right and sound big in the mix. In addition, when I use a reverb to sweeten them up a bit, it throws off the timing and muddies everything up. Any suggestions on effects, EQ, or routing? This is a good follow up to uh, the previous question. Um, yeah, mixing strings with uh, you know other instruments, guitars and drums and heavy heavy stuff, um, it can be challenging because a lot of times the guitars, you know, they take up a lot of space frequency wise in the mix, uh, and then uh, the orchestral stuff or the strings um, will also occupy a lot of the same space. So you have to do a lot more aggressive filtering on both you know guitars and the string and synth stuff. Um, and then also some maybe EQ that uh, seems counterintuitive at first. Um, in the past, I've talked about EQing in mono. This is a huge thing here because it's really going to let you, uh, it's going to force you to hear the frequency masking issues between strings and guitars and other parts of your mix. So make sure you're trying to EQ in mono with that. Um, but with strings, what I, what I try to do is, um, you know, if it's a heavy rock or metal track with strings, I'll get the guitar sounding good first. Um, and then I will bring in the strings in mono again, and I'll start, you know, EQing, I'll, I'll do a little boost on the EQ and I'll start sweeping it around the mid range. And I'll try to find a spot where it hits the boost and it's, uh, 
the strings just kind of pop out of the mix. Um, and usually it's in a weird spot, like uh, sometimes it can be 600 hertz or 800 hertz, like something that you would not just grab the EQ to boost on strings, you know. Uh, typically if you're just grabbing an EQ, like you want something to be brighter or more bass or something or more like, you know, grit in the mid-range or something, um, you wouldn't really reach for like 700 hertz to boost. But sometimes if you're in mono and you're listening to the whole mix and you grab the string track and you're, you kind of play around with where it's boosting, um, you usually can find a spot in the mid-range where it's going to kind of occupy its own space and uh, actually cut through the mix and uh, and be heard and sound pretty good. So that's one thing. Uh, often with these orchestral uh, parts, I'll have to add a lot of brightness. Um, or sometimes the opposite, sometimes filtering out some top end to make room for some other element in the mix. Um, so the, basically the more layers you have of anything, you just need to be more aggressive with filtering. Um, so if you've got, if it's a really low tune heavy song, don't try to get low end from the strings, like cut out the low end there. Um, uh, and let's say you have some lower uh, strings like cellos and whatnot and some higher ones like violin. Maybe you want to play around with like filtering at high end from the, from the lower instruments and putting more high end in the higher instruments and just trying to carve out those spaces. Um, and sometimes, you know, it can really be very aggressive in your filters. Um, you know, especially with extra guitar layers too. If you've got lots of guitar layers and lots of string layers, you know, definitely filter out those guitar layers so they're very limited in their frequency range so that, again, in the context of the whole mix, you know, don't mix in solo. Like, make sure you're doing this in the context of the whole mix. Um, you know, maybe in solo, like that guitar, that string track sounds like it's really thin or lacking, but in the context of the whole mix, it's all fitting together. So my big tip is, yeah, uh, EQing in mono um, and then uh, just finding those frequencies that you might not, know you know you might not instinctively know to boost you know at 600 hertz on a string track um, but in the context of of the mix and eqing in mono you might find that spot so that's something in terms of your reverb maybe you mean that just long reverbs are kind of just muddying up the attack of, of stuff you can try using a pre-delay on your reverb and then uh, i'd say other than that maybe try eqing the reverb return as well so make sure you're using a send and return setup for your reverbs and effects and then on the reverb return track um, you might need to maybe cut out some of the high end so that uh, the high end attack from your strings um, in the mix is still coming through without being clouded over by the reverb. So maybe you filter out the high end at, you know, 2K of your reverb um, so that you get the lower end of the reverb, um, but not to the, uh, the high end of it. Um, and that might clean up your high end. Same thing with the low end. You might want to filter out the low end from your reverb. Um, that's a pretty common thing to do. So those are the, some things to try uh, for your string tracks. Our next question comes from Jeremy. Hey man, is there a video you have done on proper gain staging for recording vocals and how to compress limit screaming vocals as well? I don't have a specific video on this yet, but um, if you look at my video that's called Proof That You Can Mix With Stock Plugins, um, it does go through my vocal chain there, so you'll see multiple stages of compression. Um, I'll just go, go through uh, uh, my typical vocal setup real quick for you. Um, so if I recorded the vocals, I, I'll compress them on the way in with a distressor, um, usually doing, you know, 5 to 12 dB of, of uh, gain reduction there. The distressor is really transparent. I'm not afraid to get a decent amount of compression there. So I'm uh, really evening it off, like right off the bat. Then from there... Um, doing some EQ and then more compression, usually with fast attack, fast release, trying to get more attitude and energy out of it, um, lots of gain reduction. And then sometimes I'll have another compressor uh, even after that, even after more EQ or, or DSing or whatever, um, just to even it off even more. Um, but usually at least uh, I'll at least have a compressor on the way in, um, one doing a lot of heavy lifting for some attitude in the vocal. And then I will put a limiter at the end, just doing like one or two dB on the peaks to really, uh, really sit it in there. Um, but yeah, I'll work on maybe getting a uh, a more in-depth vocal tutorial video up there for now. Um, you can check out uh, my more higher-end courses where I do cover in-depth a lot of vocal stuff. Okay, that's it for this episode. Thanks for checking it out as usual. If you're not on my email list, make sure you go to hardcoremusicstudio.com, grab my free mixing cheat sheet, You'll get on the email list where all my best stuff is there and uh, you'll get regular updates, lots of free videos and content. Uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel or to the podcast if you're listening on the go. And if you want to submit your question to be answered on the show, just go to askjvpod.com and uh, submit your question there and we will try to get it on the show as soon as we can. We've got lots of questions to get through, but I'll continue doing this as long as you keep asking me questions. So that's it for this week, guys. Take care.